Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, and I am so excited tonight that we are joined by several longtime author friends. We're missing them um, in store, but we're doing a virtual event with uh, Jeff Abbott, Hillary Davidson, and Meg Gardner. Um, for those of you who have been tuning into our virtual events regularly, you know we do a lot of them. Um, tomorrow night, we'll be here with uh, S.A. Cosby and Alex Segura. Uh, the next night, Friday night, we'll be back with Laura Lippman in conversation with Dan Vesperman. And then Saturday, we'll be here with Liv Constantine, the two uh, women who make up Liv Constantine, and KJ Howe in conversation. And that's just the rest of this week. Um, our July is slam packed with authors. So make sure to check out um, the upcoming events. They can be found on our Facebook page or at murderbooks.com. If you're watching this evening uh, and you have questions, don't be shy. There's no such thing as a dumb question. We love getting your questions and we'll get to them in the second half of um, the discussion. You can put them in the live chat on YouTube or you can put them in the comments on Facebook and we will get to them in just a little bit. All right, now for the stars of the show, let's get started with Jeff Abbott. Hi Jeff, how are you? Hey McKenna, how are you? Thanks for having us tonight. Of course, it's always a pleasure. Shelves behind you. Thank you, thank you. They, I, I'm rather proud of them. They're a new addition, so thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to do your formal introduction really quickly. Jeff Abbott is the New York Times best-selling author of 19 novels. He's the winner of an International Thriller Writers Award for the Sam Capra thriller The Last Minute, and is a three-time nominee for the Edgar Award. A former president of Mystery Writers of America. He lives in Austin with his family, and he's here tonight to discuss his brand new release, Ambush of Widows. And we do have signed book plates to go along with that. I've put a link already in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. You can um, find out more about the authors and their books, and more importantly, order books at that link. So we do have the signed book plates for um, Ambush of Widows. Thanks again for being here, Jeff. Thank you for having me. All right, we also have Hillary Davidson. Hi, Hillary. Hi. It's so, so good to see you. you. I know, it's, I, I, I miss seeing you in person, but this is like the next best thing. <laughs> Likewise, we're still making do, but hopefully some return to normalcy soon. We'll see how it goes. Um, let me do your bio now as well. So Hillary Davidson is the best-selling author of One Small Sacrifice and the winner of two Anthony Awards. Her novels include the Lily Moore series, and the standalone thriller, Blood Always Tells. Her widely acclaimed short stories have won numerous awards and have been featured everywhere from Ellery Queen to Thuglet, as well as in her collection, The Black Widow Club. A Toronto-born travel journalist who's lived in New York City since October 2001, Davidson is also the author of 18 nonfiction books. Um, and you are here to talk about Her Last Breath, which came out um, like a week ago, right? It's very yeah. new. Yeah, very new. So yeah, and, and I actually got the exciting news today that it's officially a bestseller. So Yay! that is my, yes, that is, is the best news. Sort of what you what you always hope for, especially because my last book came out right as the pandemic was hitting, and sort of yeah, book tour had to be canceled and everything else. So I am so grateful for the response to this book, and just so glad to be with you guys. Yeah, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Now. I always say, no offense to you two, but my favorite person tonight is Meg because she is doing my job for me. That means I get to sit back and relax. So I love when we have a guest interviewer and um, Meg Gardner is filling that role tonight. Thanks so much for being here tonight, Meg. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I get to interrogate awesome. these two and it's gonna be fun. <laughs> it is gonna be fun. I can't wait to sit back and listen. It's always good to see you. Let me uh, do your bio here quickly as well. Meg Gardner is the author of a number of critically acclaimed novels, including the Evan Delaney series, of which China Lake won the Edgar Award. Um, and your most recent book was The Dark Corners of the Night, correct? Correct. Excellent. Yeah. As I said, more information on all the books in the links. Um, if you have questions, don't be shy. Put them in here, and we will get to them in a little bit. All right. I'm going to go away. I'm going to sit back and enjoy the talk. You guys have fun. All right. Thanks, Thank McKenna. Thank you. All right, good to see both of you, even virtually here from um, all the way halfway across the continent in New York City and uh, halfway across the city here in Austin, because both uh, Jeff and I are, uh, are shouting neighbors if we had a, 
I don't know, a, a blimp or something. But uh, I am delighted to be able to talk to you about your brand new thrillers, uh, Jeff's book, An Ambush of Widows, and Hillary's uh, novel, Her Last Breath. I will ask, I, I just want this to be as conversational and fun as possible. So um, I just have just like a couple of pages of, of uh, <laughs> questions for you to take off with and discuss however you want. But I do want to um, start by saying these novels, they're both gripping, they're both exciting, they're both moving. They are entirely distinct. Uh, in setting and um, voice, they're entirely you, both of you, which is which is wonderful. They do kick off um, quite differently, of course, but they both kick off with um, a protagonist getting a um, a shocking message about a loved one. In one case, from beyond the grave. Uh, so would you care to tell us a bit about the setup in each of your novels? Uh, it'll go alphabetically. Jeff, you want to start? <laughs> I was counting on Hillary starting. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the setup. I mean, you know, one of the things I think when you're writing suspense is that we're very used to seeing the um, protagonist in their normal world before that world unravels. And with An Ambush of Widows, Hurston North's world is good for about half a paragraph, right? And until we start. And she gets a, she's in New Orleans. Her husband is on a business trip to New York and she gets an anonymous phone call from someone telling her her husband has been murdered in Austin where she did not believe him to be or have any reason to go. And um, it was, it was hard to write about someone who has just instantly learned that she has lost a loved one because I thought, how do I show the normal life that she's lost? And in this case, I had to show it when she was contemplating her husband or thinking about their lives together or thinking about times that they had in the past. Um, so it was a little unusual to not have a little more time to stage that. Um, and I think then the other challenge for me was, well, if I lost a loved one, I'd just be curled up in the corner, right? I wouldn't be like active investigator guy um, about trying to, to move forward. But then I decided that both the widows in this story and that two men have been murdered who have no reason to be together, who apparently had no connection, didn't know each other. And they're two very different widows who are new, new widows. Um, decide they're going to investigate and solve the crime. Their anger was the fuel that wouldn't let me let them kind of curl up on the bed, right? Mm -hmm. And and just deal with uh, that, that they had to be sort of um, driven into action. But at the same time, you could not ignore the grief that characters are feeling. And you, I had to look for ways where they could, you know, where they say the cracks are where the light comes in. Um, that where were there cracks where the, the light, the reality, their emotional truth were coming in? I just had to find those in the course of the story. But it was, it was really a challenge when I started it to think about how, how do I show what they've lost so that the stakes seem appropriately high for them, you know, emotionally high. Right. Well, you kicked it off with the with the with the bang, which it's a thriller, so it's not supposed to be a quiet kind of comp contemplative memoir of Kristen North's life. So you you succeeded in that. And well, Hillary, to start tell with us about uh, out, so, you know. <laughs> tell us about Deirdre. Sure, sure. So her last breath literally begins with a funeral. And so there is no time at all where you meet Deirdre before her sisters died. Um, in fact, like the first paragraph of the book, she she doesn't know what to wear to the funeral. And the person she would normally call is her sister. And there's that moment where it just hits her like she'll never talk to her sister again. She'll never hear her voice again. And so from the moment you meet her, she's in pain. And chapter one has her going to her sister's funeral. And it is, it's like a society funeral. This is, you know, a very wealthy family that her sister married into. Um, you know, there are security guards at the funeral. It, it is it is an affair. 
And Deirdre, but Deirdre is, is not from that world. No, not We're from that to talk world about at all. Yeah, exactly. coming from, She's yeah. from like a, a working class family and has a very different background. And she's estranged from her family. So chapter one, basically for her, this, this is like a very much like person, like fish out of water. Um, but it ends with her getting an electronic message from her sister that her sister set up uh, to go out before she died. And in it, it reveals three things that Deirdre has never heard before. One is that her sister is afraid of her husband. Um, two is that she fears that he's going to kill her, that like actually that bad a situation. Three is that her husband murdered his first wife and got away with it. And Deirdre has no idea even that her brother-in-law had been married before. She's never heard any of this. And so um, this really hits her in her grief. I, I relate completely to what Jeff said about, you know, if you lose someone, if you're grieving, you kind of just want to curl up in a fetal position. But in Deirdre's case, it motivates her to... It, it's not even a search for justice at the beginning. It's basically, can this message even be real? This sounds crazy. Um, it does sound like it's written by my sister because it makes a couple of family references that only her sister would know. But the the information in it is is just really kind of out there and seems crazy to her. So as the book unfolds at first, she's just trying to get to the truth of this. Like, is this even something you know, I should be listening to? The tricky thing I would say about her is that Deirdre has a lot of secrets. And so when you meet her, her grief is entirely real and, and sincere and, you know, painful and powerful. But there is a lot that she is keeping from the reader. And to some extent, I think I kind of used her grief to mask it a little bit so that the reader wouldn't or the, the readers wouldn't ask certain questions about her because there are these explosive revelations that come later. And because you sort of, I think anyone who's lost anyone close to them, there's kind of an automatic sympathy, um, you know, kind of an empathy maybe even that's extended to a character who's grieving. And so I, I think to some extent you're lulled into a sense of security with this character because it's, it's, you think it's like a one note thing. She's grieving and she just wants justice, but you discover she's a much more vengeful person um, mm. than at first appears. Right. So both novels really, I mean, they're driven by uh, characters who are um, bereaved family members, as we've been talking about, uh, who are on a hunt for the truth about uh, their loved one's death. So, Jeff, how did you, I mean, Hillary's explained very successfully about how how cagey she is about um, using using that to... Um, to draw us into the into the character and get us to overlook other things. How how did you? Um, what drew you to use this as a focus for uh, for the protagonist in the in the novel? Well, I mean, there are two widows. There's uh, Kirsten North, who's from kind of a a, a, a a tougher background in New Orleans, and then there's Flora Zhang, the other widow who is moneyed, well-educated, um, has had a, a life of, of privilege and luxury. And these two women have both had an incalculable loss, but they're both dealing with it in slightly different ways. Um, and I feel I wanted to sort of emotionally handcuff them together. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, they, they, they probably their paths would not cross. And, and I'm sorry, my dog is barking in the background. I am so annoyed. Uh, <laughs> Your dog uh, has thoughts, Jeff. My dog, has, <laughs> my dog would like to make a point. Um, uh, and the point is that someone is out front, and he's not happy about that. Um, but I wanted to sort of emotionally handcuff these women together and sort of force them into a relationship that they would not have been in otherwise. And them having to deal with each other was also the way that I could illustrate sort of the deeper aspects of their character. I kind of felt like these two women changed because they became widows, but they also revealed more of who they had always been. And sometimes in marriage, you, 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 there are people who 
if the marriage is perhaps not entirely happy, they cover up aspects of themselves to for for harmony <laughs> or to make the things go more smoothly. And when that was gone, all of this is sort of stripped away from these two women and that they're having to deal with not just the reality of their loss, but the reality of their own lives. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I love what we, we talk about, you know, that, that we have that sympathy with bereaving characters so they can get away with a little bit more um, at times. I think that's a super smart uh, insight from Hillary, not, uh, not surprising. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was sort of how I tended to explore it was by how I had to force them together. Right. And you, you've got that, that little bit of sympathy. And also you've, you have uh, both have protagonists who are not um, professional investigators. They're not, uh, they, they don't have any kind of criminal investigative background and the cops are sort of, are a presence in the story, but uh, semi-threatening to, uh, to the protagonist. Was that a deliberate choice on, on both your parts? I'm presuming the answer is yes. So explain how. <laughs> I mean, it definitely was a deliberate choice, you know, on my part. And I say that having just um, before this published two police procedural novels where I was sort of um, really mired in sort of, you know, NYPD forensics, all of these things that are, you know, relevant to a police investigation. So I made a really deliberate choice that I did not want that to be um, a a serious part of the book. Obviously, police are going to appear, um, but I I didn't want them to play a large role. And part of the way I pushed them to the background is that the sister's death, um, basically it comes out, um, and this really isn't spoilery, but it looked like she had a heart attack. And as Deirdre starts to investigate, she found finds out that her sister was actually covering up that she had a, a heart condition that had been caused by pregnancy. And I did a sort of deep dive into, you know, all of the things around that, um, confirmed with the medical examiner's office that in a case like that, they wouldn't even do an autopsy, especially if the family didn't want one. So it was very much a situation where the cops would say, your sister died, there's nothing to investigate here, let it go. And so they actually become an antagonistic presence in the book because as Deirdre pushes forward and sort of makes the steps that she does, she crosses paths with them a couple of times and they want her out of the way. They would like her to stop. Um, and so, yeah, I guess part of it is just, I, I had written a couple of books very much from a police, um, like the perspective of the police. And I really wanted to have a sort of an adversarial relationship in this book. Um, there's always been some kind of police presence in my books and in the early Lily Moore books, it was sort of maybe not central to the investigation, but kind of a friendly, helpful presence. And I think this is, you know, probably the most adversarial it's ever been. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, in, uh, in your novel, it gets sick. Uh, openly adversarial at a number of points. It, it gets openly adversarial at a number of points, but one of the things I remember the most about Detective Bard, who's in the um, in charge of the investigation, is she is, herself is a widow. And she is the one who tells them that the collective noun for a group of widows is an ambush. And, and the moment when I first found that, um, cause I thought, what do you call more than like one widow when they're together, you know? And I was, and I looked at him, I saw an ambush of widows and I didn't have a title yet. And then I did. Right. You know, cause you couldn't, couldn't pass that up. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I think it becomes more adversarial in this case because, um, one of the widows has a family tie to someone who is on the shady side of the law. And the other one uh, has been left $25 million by her husband, you know, and, and, and had a motive. So um, I, I kind of needed it to be a little more, I don't, don't, oh, I mean, I've written novels where police character, you know, police officers are major characters and it's not adversarial, but here I sort of to bind the two widows closer together, I kind of needed to give them something more of a mutual enemy that was right there in front of them. And so in this case, it worked out sort of from a dramatic sense. 
Well, yeah, it, it does in both of your books because um, when the police become a bit adversarial, that both uh, increases the need for uh, the protagonists to be the ones who, who lead and take action to try to investigate. Um, and when the police are looking at at you, <laughs> you have an extreme motive to try to uh, to find evidence that uh, will exonerate you. So uh, it's, it's, it's very effective. Um, uh, Hillary, I read a, I read a, a, a quote, Adrian McKinty says uh, about her last breath, he calls it a black sheep, uh, black sheep family drama becomes a deliciously paranoid psychological thriller. Um, when did you decide that Deirdre was going to be on the outs with her family? Uh, as soon as oh, you, as soon yeah. as you started writing or when? <laughs> that was part of the character's DNA. It, it, to me, it's always a really interesting question about what you know about a character when you start writing, because I am a seat of the pants writer. Um, I have tried outlining in the past and I have outlines for so many books that I did not successfully write <laughs> because as soon as I, start outlining, I seem to deviate from the outline. So um, it's always a seat of your pants kind of experience. And when I start writing, most of this book is written from Deirdre's point of view. So I started out knowing certain things about her. I had a sense of her as an angry, kind of isolated character. I knew that she didn't really have a lot of close ties. Um, I knew that she was estranged from most of her family and that there was an ugly history there. There's actually a history of violence in the family that is the reason. So this actually goes back years. It's not that there was just an argument and they decided to stop speaking. It's actually runs much deeper than that. Um, and I thought of her as someone who was really sort of traumatized by the abuse in her family. And the way that she copes is by not acknowledging it and retreating into her shell and sort of um, presenting herself as sort of tough and independent and sort of um, like, a, like a rough edge to her and, you know, not letting anyone in. So I knew all of these things about her when I started. I didn't know all of like the finer points and the secrets, but I really sort of knew who she was and how she would act in any situation, which is basically to go on the attack. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> She's sort of always primed for conflict. And um, in some cases, that's good in the book. In some cases, that's actually a really helpful tendency because there are a couple of cases where she's legitimately threatened, where you know her fight um, response is good. And then other times where it's just not even remotely appropriate. And it, it was... One of those characters, I think there's been a lot written lately about unlikable narrators. And one of the things I wrestled with was that I don't always like what she does. I don't always like the way that she handles something or chooses something, but it was kind of part and parcel with the character. When I started thinking about her, I sort of had this idea of who she was and just really ran with it. Well, I think that that's really helpful. And I'd ask Jeff the same thing about, about um, sympathy, likable characters, whatever. I, I find that if they're fully human, it's much more interesting to, to readers uh, than just having them be sweet or sweet and sassy or whatever, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I worry more about whether they're interesting, whether they're likable. Um, there are things that Kur both Kirsten and Flora do that I probably wouldn't have made the same choice, um, but that's fine. That's who they are. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kirsten sort of exploded off the page when I started writing her. It took me, actually took me longer to get to know Flora. She mm -hmm. was holding her secrets a little tighter um, as, as I wrote her. I mean, I'm talking about like the real people and their characters in the book. They but, are. But, but yeah. Kirsten was like fully more formed in my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, when, when I started writing and I wanted that to be, to be reflective of what was in her marriage. She was married to the guy who helped her out of a terrible situation. And it was always the two of them against the world. And then when he's gone, she's lost everything. Whereas with Flora and her husband, she starts to realize she didn't even really know him. Right. So it was like in the opposite sides of the marriage um, it, that that these two very different marriages. 
and 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 <laughs> with unlikable things happening in both marriages. But yeah, I, I just always tend to worry about whether or not the person is interesting more than whether or not they're they're likable. I mean, because a character does something does not mean the author endorses that choice. You know, people get confused by that sometimes. And it's the characters acting in what they think is their best interest or their selfishness or their anger or their joy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, your major characters aren't aren't so much black sheep as, um, well, abandoned or orphaned sheep. Uh, uh, what drew you to make Kirsten um, a former foster child and, and to give her a foster brother? Well, I wanted to, um, I wanted to have her sort of accentuate this idea that a lot of her life had been unsettled. We learn later in the book, her father is from Denmark. He was a medical student in New Orleans. He married her mother. His parents didn't approve. He went back to Denmark and never reached out to her again. Mm -hmm. But she finally, when she's in high school, gets a family, a, a happy placement in a foster home with a foster brother who becomes a real brother to her. And I wanted him to be sort of a complicating factor um, but also to show sort of the openness of her heart, you know, that that she she let herself love again after all this abandonment, after all these problems and issues. She opened herself. She let herself love again in that family. And then she fell in love with the boy next door, the literally the boy next door. And that was her guy. And mm -hmm. so I just I kind of wanted her to have gone through this these difficulties because I wanted her to show that the steel she was made of to go ahead when difficulty came again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to do any, get in, get spoilery in any way, but I think if she had had just a very cushy um, suburban upbringing, uh, she wouldn't have have any of the steel that you mentioned to, to uh, decide that she's going to find who the person it was who killed her husband and become yeah. a human bullet herself. Yeah, <laughs> and, she and basically them. starts to think of herself as a bullet that she's going to aim at the guy who took out her man, you right. know? And, and so. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing you both do is you really have dual protagonists in, in, in the novel. I mean, they're, they're bad guys. There are people getting, uh, getting killed. Um, but unlike so many other novels, which we've all written that where you would have a protagonist in point of view and perhaps an antagonist point of view, you have, um, two very strong protagonists and we see we we see uh, scenes from each of their points of view sometimes alternating and i that's an extremely successful strategy that you both use because then the reader has more information at some points than either of the characters do because we know something of what's in one protagonist's head uh well, like we know what Kristen's think, Kristen's thinking, but uh, Flora doesn't know, uh, and vice versa. And Hillary, we know what Deirdre's up to, uh, but Theo, her brother-in-law, her sister's, uh, her sister's widower, who uh, who she's been told is is uh, a killer. Uh, you know, uh, he doesn't know that she's on that trail initially, and uh, then we're in his head. Uh, and there's all kinds of stuff that he that we're learning about him that 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 Deirdre doesn't know, and it's it's a fascinating choice. Um, was there a reason that you guys both came up with this, or or? Uh, I mean, about, uh, yeah. I can, well, I'll tell you in my case, which I will be completely honest and say, when I sort of had the idea for the book, it was just writing it from Deirdre's point of view. It was just, you know, being the story being told from that point of view. But after I got maybe a third of the way in, I started thinking, I really, really want there to be a counterpoint. You know, I, I and I thought, like, if I could pull this off, this would be great. And I wrote one chapter from Theo's point of view. Theo is, um, you know, like you mentioned, her sister's widower. Um, all you know of him is that her sister says that he um, may be responsible for her death and that he killed his first wife. And once you're inside his head, you start seeing what a damaged person 
he is. And you realize that, yes, he does indeed have a dead first wife. And and yet, even with all of that, um, it, it you start to realize that he and Deirdre actually have a lot in common, that there's actually... Um, a lot of abuse, you know, that he grew up with in his family, not the physical abuse that there was in Deirdre's family, but more psychological abuse, gaslighting, um, and that this sort of trauma is at the core of his character. And even though I don't know if it would actually make you like him, I think you start to understand where they're both coming from. I honestly worried when I was writing that I would be giving too much away by telling things from Theo's point of view and that it would actually decrease the suspense in the book. And But in retrospect, I, I think it sort of amped it up because it created a situation where you've got sort of more than one mystery that's being mm -hmm. solved. There's the sort of the, the mystery of what really happened with Caroline and how she died. But then you actually have a family mystery in the background on each side. And to some extent, both Deirdre and Theo want to, they, they both want to get to the truth of those things. So it was a strange kind of counterpoint. I will admit, I did not know what I was doing when I started on this path. Um, but it's um, it ended up, I think, maybe being my favorite thing about the book, that you actually get inside the head of the person who's supposed to be the antagonist. Mm -hmm. And so you look at them differently, but you also look at every bit of information differently because both characters actually play fair with the reader. They're not lying to the reader, but they believe entirely different things about what they see. And you as the reader, you don't really know you know, which one to go with and which one to trust. Right, exactly. And Jeff? Well, um, my previous novel, Never Ask Me, was about a family of four. And I told that from four points of view. So doing a book with two points of view felt like a vacation after that. <laughs> um, but I think I made the decision because it is two widows. And so they each have their own story. And so it just seemed like the natural structure for it. it I had thought that was how it was going to be really pretty much from the beginning. I think I toyed briefly with just writing it all from Kirsten's viewpoint. And then I was like, no, it, 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 we need to see how both of these women are dealing with this mutual tragedy and, and crime. So mm -hmm. well, that yeah, was a and fairly I think simple decision for me. Yeah, That's and they both right. have, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it shows us, you know, literally different aspects uh, of the story. I think either one of them on their own would have, um, could have become claustrophobic, but this opens it all all up uh, and deepens and deepens it as, as well. Um, By yeah, the way, I, I love how these novels like play. I'm, copy, I'm just realized I feel like I'm copying Jeff in every way because my two books before this were also told from four points of view. <laughs> I feel like Jeff and I are like psychically connected at this point or something that we're just sort of like, yeah, exactly. We're, we're just determined <laughs> to sort of move on this path. It's, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not well, well, I have to say that as, that as far as these books, um, <gasps> You know, I love how the how the the novels pull all the protagonists into increasing danger as uh, as you know their investigations peel back the layers of these onions to get to the truth, um, and that's also how uh, we as readers delve into their juicy secrets uh, as uh, as they're all revealed. So, they're they're both of these books kind of the they they look at uh, you know what's what are lies versus truth. Um, but, but both about how characters learn about themselves as the story progresses, uh, which not only advances the plot, but enriches our understanding uh, and concern for all of them. And even when they're at each other's throats, which I really love about, about both these books. Um, another thing that they do have in common is that they, they're both about the uh, intersection of family and money. <laughs> Uh, or lack thereof um, in all kinds of ways. Oh yeah, uh, haves and have nots, um, how that affects one's life, viewpoint, desires, assumptions about the world. Um, and it also affects how 
the power that money uh, provides comes into play with um, with uh, with being put into into force against in uh, against Deirdre and, uh, and and Theo in the in 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 her last breath, and um, being a benefit, but also um, providing a threat to Flora in uh, an ambush of widows because, uh, you know, as you said, money is the motive. Did you have fun um, giving us uh, some protagonists who are ones living in a basement, ones uh, got a, a you know a beat up old you know an old beater she drives, and the others you know fly on private jets. <laughs> I mean, there is something I think delicious about that sort of contrast, and you know, in a weird way, with social media now, now we're allowed into so many different worlds. You know, so it's like. Some of this maybe at some point in the past might have seemed really inaccessible or unlikely, but there's, I think, now a sense of like how the 0.1 of 1% lives, where it's like, oh no, people actually know that these things are possible. Um, I, I guess I always think of money as like it enables people to do things, and yet it also can be the ultimate pair of handcuffs. And so you had, like you mentioned, you know, Deirdre lives in a basement apartment. She works at a company that may or may not be similar to Instacart. Um, she, you know, does not have a fun life. She does not have money. She lives on protein bars. Um, you know, meanwhile, her brother-in-law, Theo, is from a really wealthy family, but he has walked away from that family. Um, his family has incredible wealth, and he has tried to distance himself from it, which you, as the reader moves through the book, you start to see that his wife was actually much closer to his family than he was, and that sort of he's the black sheep of the family, and that mm -hmm. she was really welcomed into the family. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it, it's you know, I think part of um, when I talked about like manipulation and gaslighting in the family, one of the really uncomfortable dynamics is that Theo is one of two kids in his family and his sister Juliet is a little older than he is, brilliant, uh, like kind of a, a sharp tongued person, but she runs the business and his father doesn't care. His father wants his son who has the same name that he does to run the family business. And there's all of this sort of jockeying for position, manipulation, um, all about sort of like the family inheritance, which ironically Theo doesn't even want. So it's in the background of the book, but it, it affects characters a lot. There are times when it sort of comes into the foreground. And I, I just felt like that was a really fun dynamic to play with. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Abbott. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking at one, two different reactions to becoming widows. With Flora, she doesn't have to move into the penthouse of an Austin high rise that Adam had bought that where she really didn't want to live. She can stay in her mansion in Lake Haven, you know. <laughs> at the same time, Kirsten is thinking that with Henry gone, and she only realizes this maybe two, three days into her shock she may not be able to afford their rent payment without his income. Mm -hmm. And so you have one, one who is just so, has so much. And there's a point Kirsten thinks about, you have so much, will you even miss him, mm -hmm. right? You know, we miss him the way that I miss my husband. And, and why she's missing Henry is not about economics, right? So it is, I mean, it, that, those were probably the sort of the two most far extremes I've ever had with co-protagonists being this, this gulf between them financially. But, you know, it was just, to me, it was another way to create conflict or doubt between them. It's not like these two widows come together and they're suddenly best friends. Right. They're not. There's a lot of blame and other stuff flying between them. <laughs> My dog agrees. <laughs> And I will, I will say we, we've been talking so much about the protagonists. Um, we do have some pretty shady antagonists, uh, some people in Berlin uh, and in New York in, in uh, Her Last Breath and a um, uh, uh, openly uh, explicit hitman in uh, Ambush where, uh, um, who has concerns of his own. He's really getting tired of this job because he has, he has something else he needs to do, right? Jeff? 
yeah, he's about to become a father. And so we have this whole thing with this man is thinking about how do I kill, how do I kill the, the you know, he wants to kill Kirsten. How do I kill Kirsten so I can get back in time before my wife's in labor? And did I, you know, we haven't picked out the name and then he has project management issues. His handler does not get him, cannot get him a gun after he's thrown away a perfectly good gun. And then he has to do another murder. I wanted to give him like job problems, job <laughs> problems that, 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 that people who are about to go on maternity or paternity leave. Are with. It's real issues. It's all real about issues. life. This Man, all about, problems. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's all about life, and he's planning out death. I, mean, I said in an interview, he has all these suburban problems, and then he goes to exciting locales to kill people. You know, so it's uh, it was he was actually a lot of fun to write um, because I kept thinking about all the things that I was dealing with right before I became a father, um, and so yeah. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> Nobody's there to hear you talk about these problems right now, Jeff. <laughs> she just can't, she just keeps tossing and turning. She just keeps rolling over. And she's just, she can't get comfortable and her feet are swollen and she will not shut up about it. <laughs> she can't get comfortable. Her mother is there to help her. And he likes his mother-in-law. We find out that we find out way more about the hitman's personal life than what we people were probably intending. But that was to give him his stakes in case things go wrong for him where, you know, he's got to then try to extract himself from a, a, a bad situation. But mm -hmm. right. As well as providing like deadly peril to, to the people in the story. But uh, yes, he's got to go through the list of names as well. So um, <laughs> uh, we have a few more minutes here to, uh, um, to talk about it. I would just say, um, you know, I wouldn't call your character, any of your characters, unreliable narrators, which is all, which has been something that we've seen a lot of recently in, in the past few years and, and particularly in thrillers and crime fiction. Um, but uh, they, and you do withhold and sometimes present uh, facts um, unreliably. Um, what do you think of this device? Do you ever, do you use it? Do you subvert it? I mean, you can call someone unreliable because they're lying or because uh, they've been misled, because they're misperceiving something. Um, do you do you like dislike use it in in your books or these? <laughs> so I would say there are sort of two different ways in her last breath, and it's actually really distinct. So with Deidre, the way that I would describe her as unreliable is that she withholds information. So she will tell you things up front. She will tell you that her father is a monster. Um, she will reluctantly admit that her father abused her mother and she has these memories of him hitting her. Like all of these things are true, but she is withholding information even as she reveals these things. And so with Deidre, there's literally never an example where she lies to you, but you know, it's someone who's holding a lot of cards close to her chest. In Theo's case, it's actually quite different. He's also kind of um, markedly honest. He's upfront. In his case, he has a sort of checkered past where he was an addict at one point. Um, he he can't trust his own memory. There's actually like, one of the things that is sort of like really disturbing partway through the book, and I don't want to get into spoilers here, but I'll just sort of talk around it a little bit, is that there's a childhood incident that left him covered in scars. And it was mentioned in a profile that was written about him. And it's just something that's part of like the lore in Theo's family. Someone might mention it in an offhand kind of way. Um, and he learns some information partway through that puts everything about this childhood story in question. And it really troubles him because he remembers it happening. And so there's this sort of sense with him that you're kind of on quicksand because he's not lying to the reader, but there are instances where he clearly does not know what is fact and what is fiction. And so I really like sort of both of both 
of the main characters have their issues and their distinct issues, but it means that as the reader, you're kind of always like checking over your shoulder. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you should be taking it for a reader. It's fun for the reader <laughs> yeah. to try to figure out where that's it's meant going. to be hard. Like it's meant yeah. to sort of like, you know, you you're getting to first person narrations. So right. how much can you trust the source? Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you have someone who withholds a lot <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, both of, all these characters have secrets. I mean, mm -hmm. people have secrets. You know, some of them are are more compelling secrets than than others. I I mean, you know, I but I I feel like we, sometimes we cast too wide a net as to what really is an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who doesn't remember or someone who doesn't know something is not necessarily not being reliable. You know. I, I see people who post nothing but pictures of perfect life on Facebook. Everything they post on Facebook is the perfect dinner, the perfect party, the perfect, you know, uh, activity. Stop talking about yourself, Jeff. <laughs> you know, and that is an unreliable narrator right there. We're surrounded by them because it's all curated, right? Mm -hmm. it, everything is passing through a filter of, for whatever reason. And of course for Facebook, that's harmless. But they have they have a filter that they're passing things through on what they share and don't share the world. I mean, I think unreliable narrators, you know, they're just kind of part of the field in which we write. Mm -hmm. um, some people do them really, really, really well. And, and you can learn a lot from from studying those books if that's what you're interested in writing. But um, um, I don't I don't. I don't know that I sit down and I think, okay, well, how unreliable is this narrator going to be? I think I tend to think about it in the terms that maybe they think about it. What choice do they make in the moment, whether they're withholding or sharing information because they have a reason to do so? Right. That's kind right. of how I think of it. And I like, oh, sorry, I was gonna say, I like what Jeff was saying about how there's sort of like a, maybe an overuse of that trope or too many narrators being described that way because I, you know, I didn't think of either of my narrators as unreliable narrators in that they're not actively trying to deceive anybody. There's no point in the book where they're trying to mm -hmm. deceive. And to me, that's really the dividing line where, you know, do you actually, is it a um, kind of, you know, Dorothy B. Hughes in a lonely place kind of thing? Like, is there an active deception going on? Mm -hmm. Or is this, you know, a person who, if you think of it as you meet someone, you know, because these characters, I think, are very real to us. You don't meet someone and have them spill all their secrets. And you'd probably run away from them if they did in real life. And a character sort of has to reveal themselves slowly, too, I think, to be realistic. Exactly. Okay, I think we have time for a quick wrap up before McKenna comes back in here. Do you guys have any last words for readers about, uh, about your books? Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for listening to us. Thanks for supporting us. Um, thanks for supporting Murder by the Book. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Hillary. Oh my goodness. I just I have to echo all the thank yous and that I can't wait to read Jeff's book. <laughs> I I actually did just order it from Murder by the Book. So I am so excited to read this. Well, thank, so. thank you, Hillary. I'm looking forward to reading yours as well. Yes. Meg, you did such a great job. Thank yes. you so much. I'd like to give you just a chance um, to talk about your books for just a, a quick moment. It's always such um, a nice thing when people come on and guest moderate and tell us what you're working on and what we're looking forward to in the future. Oh, okay. Um, I My next book will be book number four in the Unsub series about an FBI profiler, Caitlin Hendricks. Number three, uh, The Dark Corners of the Night is out now. And that is the book that has uh, been uh, bought by Amazon Studios for development as a television series. So I'm hoping that the, uh, there will be yet another way to imbibe the, these uh, characters and stories before before too long. Uh, Unsub 4 will be coming out in details very soon. And, you know, just keeping my head down and uh, continuing to uh, to write away. As long as, there's a, as, long as human nature uh, continues as it is, we'll have plenty of things about terrible doings to write about. So I think we're yeah. in good shape. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we do have some questions. So, um, is Jeff ever going to write another Sam Capra book? I am writing Sam number six right now. So the answer is yes, it will be out next summer, assuming I get it finished on time. 
Um, it is. It has been several years since the last Sam, and in this one, we are jumping forward in time. Um, so it's not going to the the first five Sam books all took place in about five months. No, but, you know, in a compressed time period. But yeah, no, it will be um, jumping forward to where Sam is a suburban father with his 13 year old son. And uh, he is, uh, I, I won't say more than that right now. But well, we it's, have some it's very exciting people about it. I'm sorry. People are excited. People are excited in the comments. They're glad that Sam Capra is coming back. So mm -hmm. that's exciting. Um, Okay, this is for all of you. Let's make this for all of you. Who's your favorite character you've ever written and who's your least favorite? Um, let's start with you, Hillary. Oh my goodness. You know, it's like, is it a terrible comparison to say it's like picking amongst your children? <laughs> I always feel that the most recent book is the favorite book. Um, and maybe that's because it's freshest in my mind. Um, you know, I, I really do genuinely love the characters in this book. And I mean that of like both Deirdre and Theo. Um, I don't know about least favorite. Um, I I guess there have been a couple of really, um, I mean, I've certainly written some very nasty villains, um, you know, in my books. And I'm honestly trying to think of who to name where it's not a spoiler. <laughs> I want to give away that like here was the bad guy in this book um but i i think maybe in blood always tells the the villain in that book um is just such a manipulator and really thinks that they're such a great manipulator of people and have like done such terrible things to so many people without them knowing about it and that to me is much more hideous than someone who acts out in anger, someone who might get angry and do one terrible thing. Someone who has a pattern for years of manipulation is, is just a nightmare to me. So I'd say that's probably like the worst character that I've ever written. All right. How about you, Meg? Gosh, uh, well, I say because I live with Caitlin Hendricks uh, night and day at the moment, then I've had, she's very different from me. She's an FBI agent. She's uh She's younger, she's braver, she's had a tougher life than I have. So I've had to really get to know her well because I have to make sure that she's not just a clone of myself. And I've had to learn to to love her and uh, have her come fully to life and uh, as a person that's that's very different from me and that's really a a real heroine. So she's she's my favorite. I I can't say my least favorite character because even the terrible people um, are characters that I relish. I just love writing them. If there's somebody I hate, I usually kill them off even before I get to the second draft. But um, uh, I, I do think the most one of the most monstrous is um, from China Lake, uh, Chenille Paxton, who's the, the 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 mama bear of a, a an apocalyptic cult and. Um, she uh, she wears lots of sparkly uh, eyeliner and she uh, mainlines ready whip right out of the can and eventually she keeps her husband's body on ice in a um, in a in a uh, garage freezer underneath the, the the packets of lean cuisine. So um, she's so autobiographical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, who's yours? <laughs> Am I allowed to answer now? No. You know, well, I know, I know where you live. I, <laughs> I can hear that dog. <laughs> people, yeah. People want me to say Sam Capra, right? But I actually think my favorite character I've ever written when I think about it is Jane Norton um, in Blame, who is a, a 21 year old amnesiac trying to solve her own attempted murder. And I feel that Jane was my favorite character because she was the most vulnerable character I've ever written. And I just, and people will say how, you know, you're a guy in your fifties and you're writing about this 19 to her life when she's 19 to 21, a woman, how did you do that? And it was like, because I felt every bit of pain that she felt at, at times going through that. So Jane has always been kind of sentimentally a favorite of mine. My least favorite character, I do have one, was the villain in one of the Sam Capra novels, Downfall. There's a guy named Belias who built, and Belias is a, is an, a synonym for the devil. And he built this network of people who did favors for each other 
sort of stranger on a train. You know, you kill my enemy, I'll kill your enemy, and we both both advanced. And I thought he was the single most calculating person I'd ever written, just stripped of emotion. And then, of course, when I wrote him, I gave him emotions and I tried to make him sympathetic at times. But I just I did not like him as a person at all. It's reassuring. <laughs> Fair enough. Like um, we do have a, a question, another question specifically for Jeff. Um, so let me put it up on the screen. Kind of off topic, but did it take you a while to get back into writing after the house fire? Um, yes. <laughs> I had, I was, I was almost finished when a book with a book when the house burned. Um, that was when blame was coming out. I actually had to cancel about half my tour and I was, uh, well, I bragged that I was only three days late turning in the book, but the book that I turned in was a mess because <laughs> I had to finish writing it in about the first month after the fire. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then my editor was like, well, we can work on this a little bit. It was extremely generous and kind and helped me back through it. But, you know, when this is like something that you do to, feed your family and put a roof over your head or, or when, or lack thereof, uh, at that point, um, you kinda, you kinda have to keep going with it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely, it was, it was definitely disruptive. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that we don't end on that note, what have you guys read, um, recently and enjoyed? I'll just go around. Um, let's start with you, Hillary. Oh, wow. Um, there have been several books lately. It's funny because I like reading advances of some things and um, in other cases, catching up on other books. Um, but, uh, and of course, my mind is now going blank. Um, I read the um, Edgar winning When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole, which is um, a thriller or murder story uh, set in a gentrifying neighborhood in Brooklyn. And it, it is a fantastic setup because it sort of takes that question of like, you know, you need people to disappear in order for properties to become available so that other people can buy them and move in. And what if someone actually were just getting rid of those people? And so I loved it. It was, it was just such a well done story. Um, so I love that. And I'll just also add that um, Susan Elia McNeil, who is a writer I love, her new book, The Hollywood Spy, just came out on Tuesday. Yeah. That was one that I got an advance read of, and it's the 10th in her Maggie Hope series, and I loved it. In it, Maggie is in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's if you good. haven't discovered that series yet, do yourself a favor and pick up a Susan Elia McNeil book. And we will have her um, as an event, virtual event, I believe next week. So oh, I don't know the date in front of me, but... Um, we'll be doing a chat with her as usual. Um, okay, how about you, Meg? What have you read and loved recently? Gosh, I'm just about to finish uh, Sarah Paretsky's Deadland, and I can just say that she gets better with every book. I mean, she's so been doing this for almost 40 years with the V.I. Warshawski, and this book is just um, it's 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 just at the just absolutely at the top of her game. I'm just really loving it. The other book I recently read that it, I loved, 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 and it terrified me was uh, The Only Good Indians um, by Stephen Graham Jones, um, which is, I mean, he he gleefully uh, you know says it's a horror novel, and it is, but it's um, it's uh, just beautifully written, scary as as hell, and um, uh, a hero arises who, um, well, she plays for the eighth grade girls basketball team, and that's uh, that's uh, the best thing I can say about this book. So I, I loved it. Excellent. How about you, Jeff? Uh, I just read, which I bought from Murder by the Book. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Chris Pavone's uh, The Travelers, yep. uh, which is a... Um, kind of an espionage thriller about a travel writer who works for a magazine called Travelers who gets pulled into um, a, a scheme uh, where it seems like everyone around him is also somehow involved in double crossing. And that was my vacation read and I really enjoyed it. Uh, the next book I'm really looking forward to reading is Laura Lippman's new one, uh, Dream Girl. Yeah. Um, just, I really enjoy Laura's novels. 
So. And we will be, uh, we'll have her and Dan Festerman in conversation on Friday. So. He's a great writer too. So. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait for that one. It's going to be fun. Um, Dream Girl is excellent. Okay. Thank you all three so much. Um, thanks to everyone watching. I'm going to go ahead and sign us off for the night um, before Jeff's dog barks again. <laughs> Um, as I've mentioned, for more information about any of the authors or their books or to order, there's a link in the comments. Um, and we hope to see you for some of our other virtual events coming up. You can find those all at murderbooks.com. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, thanks, Jeff and Hillary.